Lots of things affect a wine's character. Where it's grown, how it's farmed, when it's picked, but also who makes it, where they're from, what they believe. The folks who grow wine in California bring a different kind of spirit to the task, a confidence born of ingenuity, a longing to leave things better than they found them. In California, we have a golden state of mind. We believe in opportunity, in fresh starts. That's how the state was first settled. It's what drew every wave of immigrants and dreamers that followed. We have a knack for challenging the status quo. Free speech, gay rights, the labor movement, all flourish here because we believe we can make a difference. The first environmental battles were fought in California. The most aggressive responses to climate change originate here. Many of the biggest cultural and technological developments of the last half century have come from California. What starts here finds its way everywhere. California wine growers have an instinct for innovation and an appetite for experimentation. We're not bound by tradition, but enlightened by it. More than 110 different wine grapes grow here. They grow in places with names both familiar and surprising each with its own distinct mix of soils, climate, and terrain. All with abundant sunshine and a long growing season, thanks to the cooling effects of the Pacific. In California, we are committed to growing and making wine sustainably. We have more acres of certified sustainable vineyards than any other region. More than 80% of our wines are made in wineries that are certified sustainable. We are committed to the well-being of vineyard and winery workers and the needs of local communities for jobs, healthcare, housing, and training. Agriculture depends on all of these things. This is the new California. Our wines give voice not just to the earth, but the ethos of those who make it. California Wines as alive as the place they're grown. Lots of things affect a wine's character. Where it's grown, how it's farmed, when it's picked, but also who makes it, where they're from, what they believe. 
The folks who grow wine in California bring a different kind of spirit to the task. A confidence born of ingenuity. A longing to leave things better than they found them. In California, we have a golden state of mind. We believe in opportunity, in fresh starts. That's how the state was first settled. It's what drew every wave of immigrants and dreamers that followed. We have a knack for challenging the status quo. Free speech, gay rights, the labor movement, all flourish here because we believe we can make a difference. The first environmental battles were fought in California. The most aggressive responses to climate change originate here. Many of the biggest cultural and technological developments of the last half century have come from California. What starts here finds its way everywhere. California wine growers have an instinct for innovation and an appetite for experimentation. We're not bound by tradition, but enlightened by it. More than 110 different wine grapes grow here. They grow in places with names both familiar and surprising, each with its own distinct mix of soils, climate, and terrain. All with abundant sunshine and a long growing season, thanks to the cooling effects of the Pacific. In California, we are committed to growing and making wine sustainably. We have more acres of certified sustainable vineyards than any other region. More than 80% of our wines are made in wineries that are certified sustainable. We are committed to the well-being of vineyard and winery workers and the needs of local communities for jobs, healthcare, housing, and training. Agriculture depends on all of these things. This is the new California. Our wines give voice not just to the earth, but the ethos of those who make it. California wines, as alive as the place they're grown.
Hi, welcome to the California Wine Knowledge Summit, powered by the California Wine Institute and brought to you by Sonal Holland Wine Academy. Thank you for being here and thank you for joining us on an evening of discovering Californian wines. I will quickly introduce myself and we'll deep dive into the masterclass. I'm Sonal Holland. I'm a master of wine and I'm the founder educator at Sonal Holland Wine Academy, which is proudly today the country's foremost wine institution for wine and, wine and beverage education. And our courses are designed for working professionals, students and enthusiasts of wine and various other beverages. We are working very closely and very strategically with the Wine Institute of California and the Wine Institute of California is the nonprofit trade organization that represents over 1000 Californian wineries and collectively they are dedicated to uh, to the protection production and the promotion of Californian wines. California, as we know, is a force in the wine world, not just in America, but around the world. It is America's top wine producer, no doubt. It accounts for 85% of the US wines, but it is also the fourth leading producer in the world. During this presentation, I will share with you information on climate, soils, geography, history, and the diverse wine growing regions, along with touching upon sustainability efforts, food and wine pairings, and examples of attributes which make Californian wines a unique force in the world of wines. So thank you so much for your attention and enjoy this session. Let's straight away start with what makes the Californian wine region so unique. The long Californian coastline is what influences uh, the wine production in California immensely. California has 800 miles, which translates to 1,300 kilometers of coastline and is one of the longest coastlines in the world, which is adjacent to a wine growing region. And these breezes that come from the Pacific Ocean, they create ideal conditions for making high quality, for growing high quality grapes and making of high quality wines. These cool ocean breezes that are drawn inland into the warmer valleys uh, create a unique sort of a microclimate uh, and, and produces what we know as California's famous uh, coastal fog. Marine breezes and fog together create the ideal conditions uh, with a combination of warm days and cool nights for growing high quality grapes. And this marine influence extends California's growing season to allow deeper color, more, more intense flavors and optimum maturity of grapes. The ocean breezes are drawn far east towards the mountains, cooling out inland valleys and regions such as the Sacramento and the Lodi. The Californian vintners and the wine growers are leaders in combining tradition and innovation. As we all know, California is probably among the first frontiers of the new world, but it is also a land for a lot of history, a lot of tradition, uh, playing uh, together along with innovative winemaking practices, making their wines among the best in the world. Over a network of over 5,900 wine growers work with diverse climate, diverse landscape, and more than 110 wine grape varieties. The talented growers and vintners have all the natural ingredients available to them in order to make some really outstanding and different styles of wines. The, there are multi-generational families, many which originate from Italy, Germany, France, Spain, all old world countries as we know of them, but they've all over the years migrated into California, set deep roots in, in the wonderful land of California. And today the state continues to attract talent from all around the world. So really Californian wines today represent a melange of innovation and ideologies and styles of wines uh, coming from people who may have been born somewhere out of the country, but have finally found home in California to make the wines of their dreams. Let's talk a little bit about the geography and the climate and soils in California. The geography, climate and soil in California creates ideal conditions 
for quality wine grapes. There are 635,000 acres of land dedicated to growing grapes in California. And California harvests nearly 3.92 million tons of wine grapes in 2021. So wine grapes undoubtedly are the top crop in the making of wines. However, in percentage terms, you may find it mind boggling to know that all of these big numbers still represent only about 1% of California's vast terrain. So there is a lot of land and a lot of agricultural diversity in California. But of course, wine grapes remains the top crop of California. California has hundreds of diverse microclimates. All of these microclimates working together in conjunction give us different types of terroirs across California. And all these terroirs have been distinctively divided into over 142 distinct AVAs, which we know of as the American viticultural areas. As we all know, 90% of US wine exports come from California. So when we talk about US wine overall, we're talking about California wine being right at the forefront of those statistical numbers. And Californian wines are very, very export oriented. They are sold in over 138 countries, but there is also no doubt that Californians and Americans themselves love Californian wines. So a lot of it is also consumed inland, but a lot of it is also exported and sold in almost over 138 countries. California's geography is diverse. There are lots of mountains, valleys juxtaposing each other. There's, of course, the longest coastline. There are deserts. There are high elevations. There is flatland, valley land. So all of this creates a great combination of, of different kinds of microclimates, allowing for different styles of wines to be made. So the coastal mountain ranges help protect California's wine growing regions and ensure consistent growing conditions year after year. The diverse geography that is so great for grapes is also great for outdoor recreational uh, lifestyle activities like just relaxing on the beach, dramatic desert landscapes, spectacular mountains, for skiing, for hot air balloon rides, for hiking, camping and whatnot. And trust me, I know this because when I was in California, I actually had a chance to experience all of this. Speaking of vineyards, vineyards thrive on hillsides, as we all know, because land on hillsides is poorer, the, the soils are more free draining, and that really produces the right level of stress in the vines in order to be able to produce high quality grapes. So they really thrive on hillsides in, in valleys, near the coast, rivers, and lakes because of this unique sort of microclimate. California, as I mentioned, has 142 American viticultural areas. And what are they? These are US government approved wine growing areas. So what we know of in the old world as appellations are typically referred to in California as AVAs. And each AVA is known for having its own geographical distinctive features, its own climate and its own history and legend. Now, this particular slide illustrates how the cool air from the ocean sort of comes in, it intersects and mixes with the warm in air, inland air, and it creates the California's famous fog. This fog allows the vineyards to be protected from the harsh or sometimes uh, blazing sunshine. But California's warm days and subsequently cool nights and cool evenings are what create the ideal microclimate for wine grape growing. Warm days are great because they help ripening of the grapes during the daytime. But during the evening, you really want the temperatures to drop so that the grapes have a chance to retain their freshness, to retain their acidity, to slow down their ripening and be able to give you the fruit flavors that are fresh, that are vibrant and, and you know, full of character. As a result of California's long coastline, and it's varied topography. We have abundant sunshine and we have a lot of maritime influence in California. Warm inland air represented by the orange shape that you can see here uh, is, is what mixes with the cool coastal air, which in this diagram is represented with the blue shape. They meet together and they collect it. You know, when, when cool meets hot, it kind of 
creates a fog and California enjoys idly long, consistent and dry growing season, which generally starts with bud break in around March and harvests uh, around, you know, starts from September, October onwards and sometimes can last through entire November, depending on the styles of wines that a winemaker is looking to make. The geological formation of California uh, created a large diversity of soil types. There are so many different soil types, as you can see, ranging from sand, clay, loam, granite, volcanic ash, seabed soils, riverbed gravel. All of these in combination allow for the right amount of water retention in the soil, right amount of water drainage, right amount of complexity, right amount of minerality coming through in the various styles of wines that get produced in California. And it, you'll find it fascinating to know that there are more than 2,800 different soil types in California. So much soil, so much terroir, so much complexity. There are dozens of distinctive wine growing regions in California. As I mentioned earlier, there are 142 AVAs, and all of these are government recognized wine growing regions. Wine labels, when you look at, when you pick up a bottle of an American wine, typically on a wine label, you will either see the name of an AVA written or the name of a county or the state, uh, as is the same as an appellation. Now let's quickly go through what are these different broad regions of California. Starting with the North Coast. Some of North Coast's best known regions include the Lake County, Los Carneros, Mendocino County, the Napa Valley, and the Sonoma County. We know of these names, they're very famous, and California's North Coast has almost close to 54 AVAs. It is home to more than half of California's wineries, and the scenery along the North Coast is really picturesque. It's memorable. Lots of beaches dotted with, you know, seaside cliffs, some towering redwoods, uh, rolling hills, um, lots of oak trees. Uh, these are all part of the scenic pastoral landscape of the north coast of California. Coming more to the central coast, some of the best known regions located here are Livermore, Livermore Valley, Monterey County, Paso Robles, as we know of it, San Benito County, San Francisco Bay, San Luis Obispo County, Santa Barbara, and Santa Clara County. Santa Cruz Mountains also are located adjacent to the Central Coast. California's Central Coast has 43 AVAs and it also surrounds the Santa Cruz, the famous Santa Cruz Mountain AVA. It is uh, the Central Coast of California is among the fastest growing, probably among the most fashionable wine regions in the state and with over 350 wineries which are located alone in Paso Robles. Yeah, grapes have been cultivated here since the 1700s. So a lot of legacy, a lot of history at play. And this region is gaining more and more recognition as more and more wineries are getting established here, even as we speak. More inland, some of Inland Valley's best known wine regions are Lodi and Delta, Madeira County, Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin, Joaquin Valley. California's inland valleys have almost close to 19 ABAs, and it comprises mainly of two valleys, San Joaquin Valley and the Sacramento Valley. This vast region, it stretches from Redding in the north to Baskerfield in the south. And one, this is probably one of the most fertile farmlands in the world. California's sunniest inland valleys are not just great for growing grapes, but also a vast amount of agricultural crops. This area grows 40% of America's nuts, vegetables, and other fruits. This area is also adjacent to prominent academic institutions. You may have heard of UC Davis, the University of California, Davis, and the Fresno State Calif uh, University. They're all located in very much this region. Some of Sierra Foothills best known regions, we're in Sierra Foothills now, and some of the best known regions here are Amador County, El Dorado County, Nevada County, and Placer County. California's Sierra Foothills are, has six AVAs, and this area has become the epicenter of the Californian 
gold rush. Gold was first discovered near Sacramento way back in 1848. And during the gold rush of 1849, nearly more than half a million people migrated from around the world and came here in search of gold. But when they came in search of gold, they also, some of them also found an incredible passion and love for wines. So for many, gold fever became more wine fever. And some of these wine growers, you know, set shop here, set up their businesses here and made California their homes permanently. And some of the oldest wineries today, like Buena Vista, who we will talk to shortly in our next panel discussion, all originate from this era around 1848 during the Californian gold rush. Uh, this is a region also known for its Zinfandels, and this area is now a vibrant region for wine grapes and touring. This area is also has a national park uh, and, and a lake called Lake Tahoe. Some of Southern California's best known regions are Cucamonga Valley, uh, Los Angeles area is close to it, San Diego County and Temecula Valley. Southern California has 12 AVAs, including the new Malibu Coast AVA. Celebrities here share blue skies, sunshine, and some of the famous beaches with quiet vineyards, which are tucked into rolling valleys and foothills. Think Hollywood celebs like Leonardo DiCaprio, Sandra Bullock, Johnny Depp. Are you impressed already? Okay, they're all, they all have homes here, second homes. Um, and... Uh, the Temecula Valley Winery is located south of the country's largest wine market, which is Los Angeles, have become a big destination for wine lovers. So this has really become an epicenter for not just great tasting rooms and wineries, but also uh, restaurants, live music, accommodations, uh, and many other wine areas in Southern California also exist here. We now come to the northernmost, Cal northernmost part of California's wine growing regions. And this is home to the Lost Coast, a remote and beautiful area of the California's coast and the new Manton Valley AVA east of Reading. Humboldt, Trinity, Shasta and Tihama counties offer diverse wine growing areas and landscapes from Redwood Forest Canyons to the Pacific Ocean. Let's take a look at some of the famous wine grapes that grow across California. I wonder if there's any name we left out there, but here is a list of some top red wine varietals which grow in California. This is in no particular alphabetical, this is more in alphabetical order and not by, by way of priority or through acreage. Cabernet Sauvignon undoubtedly is the top selling red wine of California, and this is followed by Pinot Noir and Merlot. California's signature varietal, of course, is Zinfandel. It's, you know, some, a, a grape variety that enjoys a unique history from this land. The next slide shows us the list of some of the main white grape varietals grown in California. Again, this is more in alphabetical order and not based on acreage or wine production. Chardonnay here is the top selling white wine and is followed by huge soaring popularity for Pinot Grigio and Sauvignon Blanc. Moscato and Rieslings also are showing great growth in acreage. So more, of, more and more of it is being planted. In addition to red and white wines, there's also a whole lot of other styles of wines that get made in California, but some top mentions, of course, are of California rosé wines. The red berry flavors of rosés are especially refreshing on cool autumn evenings and hot summer days and work really well with so many different kinds of foods from around the world. California's sparkling wines are typically known for their crisp acidity and their great complexity coming from the traditional method of making them. And these again pair really well with a wide range of foods, flavors, and occasions. California's dessert wines are not to be forgotten. Also known as late harvest wines, these deep elixirs provide sweet end to absolutely any meal. And these wines range from anywhere from bone dry to sweet, unctuously sweet, and really pair well with global cuisine. California is the most populous state in the US and is growing every year. 
As a result, there is competition for land, for energy, for other limited natural resources. So many people making wines here that are growing in popularity day by day. But nature is not, yes, it's abundant, but it's not infinite. So there has been a need to consciously look at more sustainable winemaking practices. And it's so amazing to know that California is right at the forefront of these sustainable uh, gr wine growing practices. The California wine community established the Code of Sustainable Wine Growing Program to use these natural resources wisely and to pass healthy, sustainable businesses to family and more particularly to the next generation. So there are some very strong environmental and labor laws and regulations at play in California. And California vintners and growers have long been environmental stewards and active members of their communities. Their Californian wineries and vineyards are primarily family, family owned. A vast majority of wineries in California are family owned. And they have a huge commitment collectively as a family to preserving the health and the beauty of the land and leave it intact for future generations. The program about sustainability is over a decade old and it is one of the most widely adopted sustainable wine growing programs in the world. In fact, it's become a benchmark template for many such other new world countries who are looking to adopt similar sustainable wine growing practices. The program includes, and it's diverse, it's comprehensive. It includes over 200 sustainable practices covering everything from grape to glass. And proud to say that over 2,100 wineries and vineyards, which, which represent a lot of vineyard acreage and a lot of winery production are participating in the California Sustainable Wine Growing Program, which is based on this code. There are over 200 practices, as I mentioned, in the Code of Sustainable Wine Growing, and these encompass activities in the vineyards and in the wineries, among the employees, community relationships, and here are just some quick examples. How do they manage vineyards for sustainability and growing of quality food, conserving of water and energy, protecting air and water quality, maintaining a healthy soil, you know, by, by, by encouraging all kinds of flora, fauna to grow within the soil, reducing the use of pesticides and insecticides and use of more natural resources for keeping the vines healthy, preserving the local ecosystems and wildlife habitats, recycling of all kinds of natural resources, practicing environmentally preferred purchasing decisions and enhancing relations with employees and communities. These are just some of the many of 200 of the codes that are practiced by the Californian wine growers uh, towards sustainable wine growing. This program was introduced in 2010 and is, is run, you know, runs very buoyantly. In fact, there are also now third party checks uh, who come and conduct these verifications on an annualized basis in order to ensure that these, uh, these sustainable growing practices are not only just adopted, but are sustainably being followed by wineries year after year. So basically at the very heart of this sustainable wine growing practice is California wine community's efforts to produce high quality wines that are environmentally sound, economically feasible and socially equitable. How wonderful is that? All right, let's talk a little bit about the culture, the, the culture of food, Californian wines. You know, there are many ethnic influences in Californian cuisine. The California cuisine is kind of hard to describe in a single sentence because there are so many influences from across the world. There's Italians, there's Germans, there's Irish to Asians and Latinos. All of these different cultural and communities have influenced the food of California. And this global cuisine from California today pairs well with a variety of wines that come from the Californian wine regions. The diversity of the wine growing regions of California with its 142 AVAs creates differences in these wine styles that pair one. So I would say there is one variety for every kind of food and there is one food or many different foods for every single grape variety out there. California, you will be fascinated to know, California grows more than 110 different 
wine grape varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon being the most popular among red, Chardonnay being the most popular among whites. And Zinfandel, as I said, enjoys a unique place of pride and prestige in the Californian wine variety repertoire. Blends are also a growing trend across California. California is experimenting and innovative, innovating with lots of different, different blends and aromatic whites like Moscatos and, and also Pinot Grigios are, are quite the trend currently in California. The availability of more than 400 local farm crops and diversity of these ethnic cultures in California have inspired some of the best chefs that work in California today to create a vast array of dishes that are fresh, that are new, that are innovative, each one of them that dazzle when paired with the Californian wines. And enjoy, visitors enjoy more than 60,000 places in California to eat and drink quite the tourism destination, I would say. California wines are growing around the world. There is no doubt. California is the fourth largest wine producer in the world and its exports have reached 1.36 billion in winery revenues. California wine sales in the US is the world's largest wine market, which we know the largest consumption market and has been growing consistently and has maintained this leadership position over the past many, many years. So I, I always say that if you want to be a wine expert, whether you're a wine professional or a wine connoisseur who loves his wines, knowledge of Californian wines is really important. It truly is the first frontier of the new world and a real force to reckon with on the global wine map. So hopefully this presentation has given you lots of incredible insights into California as a wine region and the, the vast diversity of wines that it produces. But this is not all. What if I said to you that this was really skimming 1% of what there is to discover about California? So when we said earlier today that this today's Knowledge Summit is about one, sharing knowledge, two, about helping you meet and understand the, the history and legacy of California through the eyes of some of the most iconic wine producers of California. And three is we, as we promised, we're going to give you a special access to the Capstone California Wine Course. So this masterclass uh, that you just witnessed was supported by the California Wine Institute. And to celebrate your presence in joining us today, we are giving away an exciting opportunity for you to learn more about Californian wines, the Capstone California course, uh, which, which will you know just give you much deeper insights and you have a tremendous opportunity to discover more about Californian wines. The California Wine Institute in collaboration with Sonal Holland Wine Academy, brings you the Capstone California Wine Certification Program, Introductory Level 1. This is a course that enables you with a structured learning of the California wine regions, the grape growing, winemaking practices, deep diving truly into the American viticultural system, and meeting and understanding the stories behind some of the most iconic Californian wineries. And this course comes to you absolutely free. All you really need to do is to visit our website, which is www.sonalhollandwineacademy.com, and you can take this course absolutely free. This is our way of saying thank you to you. Thank you so much for your attention and enjoy. Next up coming up is a very exciting panel discussion with some star producers of California. We'll be taking a very quick two minute break, but please don't go anywhere. We'll be back in two minutes and we'll introduce you to our exciting panel of speakers, which represent some of the best of California. See you soon.
Lots of things affect a wine's character. Where it's grown, how it's farmed, when it's picked, but also who makes it, where they're from, what they believe. The folks who grow wine in California bring a different kind of spirit to the task, a confidence born of ingenuity, a longing to leave things better than they found them. In California, we have a golden state of mind. We believe in opportunity, in fresh starts. That's how the state was first settled. It's what drew every wave of immigrants and dreamers that followed. We have a knack for challenging the status quo. Free speech, gay rights, the labor movement, all flourish here because we believe we can make a difference. The first environmental battles were fought in California. The most aggressive responses to climate change originate here. Many of the biggest cultural and technological developments of the last half century have come from California. What starts here finds its way everywhere. California wine growers have an instinct for innovation and an appetite for experimentation. We're not bound by tradition, but enlightened by it. More than 110 different wine grapes grow here. They grow in places with names both familiar and surprising, each with its own distinct mix of soils, climate, and terrain. All with abundant sunshine and a long growing season, thanks to the cooling effects of the Pacific. In California, we are committed to growing and making wine sustainably. We have more acres of certified sustainable vineyards than any other region. More than 80% of our wines are made in wineries that are certified sustainable. We are committed to the well being of vineyard and winery workers and the needs of local communities for jobs, healthcare, housing, and training. Agriculture depends on all of these things. This is the new California. Our wines give voice not just to the earth, but the ethos of those who make it. California wines, as alive as the place they're grown. Lots of things affect a wine's character. Where it's grown, how it's farmed, when it's picked, but also who makes it, where they're from, what they believe. The folks who grow wine in California bring a different kind of spirit to the task, a confidence born of ingenuity, a longing to leave things better than they found them. Hello all, welcome back. Hopefully that was a really enjoyable session you just witnessed on discovering Californian wines. And as promised, we are back for a star lineup of some of the most iconic wine producers of California. Uh, it's really not an exaggeration to say that some of these wine producers not only represent the past, but also the present and most certainly the future of Californian wine, wine, uh, wine region. They are the ones who are shaping the future and are really at the forefront of driving this revolution. So I'm really thrilled to welcome our four panelists today and I'll quickly, quickly introduce you to our respected panel. We have on a panel today, Nikki Vente, who is the director of vineyard operations for Vente Vineyards. Vente Vineyards was founded in 1883 and is the oldest continuously operated family owned winery in the country. It's owned and managed by the fourth and fifth generation of the Vente family. Welcome, Nikki. So lovely to have you with us. Thank you. It's so great to be here. 
Thank you. Next up, we have Leanne Reed, who's the International Sales Director at Boise Family Estates. And today she will talk about Buena Vista Winery. Before there were vineyards in every valley of San Francisco, and we knew of Napa and Sonoma as household names uh, of wine regions, there was, and before we even knew there was a California wine world at all, there was Buena Vista. Buena Vista Winery was founded in 1857 and spanning uh, across Sonoma and now also into Napa Valley. Buena Vista is California's first premium winery and its historic legend is as colorful as it is proud. Leanne, how thrilling to have you here with us today. Thank you. Honored to be here. Thank you. John Doxon, we have up next, who's the director of sales at Dry Creek Vineyards. It's a story of one dedicated family working day and night for over five decades to turn what many consider an idealistic pipe dream into a reality that literally revolutionized the Californian wine industry. Today, Dry Creek Vineyard is one of the tr last truly private family owned iconic wineries. And we can't wait to hear from John Doxon all about it. Welcome, John. Thank you, Sana. Thank you. And finally, we have Vivian Gay, who is a director of international sales at Silver Oak Sellers. Silver Oaks, again, needs no introduction, began over a handshake between two friends with a bold vision, uh, with, a, with a very clear focus on, on building the most iconic style of Cabernet Sauvignon there ever could be, aged exclusively in oak and so on, but basically wines that have received huge acclaim all around the world. It has a very distinctive journey, and I can't wait to hear all about it, which Vivian will share with us today. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you, Sonal. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, so we straight away kick off with, with the question for Nikki. Uh, Nikki, let me ask you, you have such a rich background and a winemaking history which spans over five generations. Um, Vente Vineyards easily is among the first few wineries that set up in California. So when you look back and you reflect on this history, this proud legacy, uh, tell us a little bit about the story and, and you know, the fact that it comes from Livermore Valley, a bit of a unique region. So tell us more about uh, Vente Vineyards coming out of Livermore Valley. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when, in 1883, when my great-great-grandfather uh, found our, our winery in Livermore, he actually found a property that was already planted to vineyard, which was really fortunate. And he had just finished working for Charles Krug up in Napa and decided that he wanted to look for a space on his own. And he was really intrigued by Livermore because it had a beautiful Mediterranean climate, really wonderful fog that comes in from San Francisco. And it was also right on a rail line, which made it really easy to transport goods. So if he was trying to sell wine, uh, it was really easy to just get that right on the railway to get over to San Francisco and to go out, out to major ports. Um, so he thought it was just quite the, the little gem of a place. Um, and we still think that today, uh, nestled right in the San Francisco Bay, it really does allow for great growing conditions, beautiful, well-drained gravel-based soils, um, and just the perfect climate for growing anything from Cabernet to Chardonnay to Sauvignon Blancs, um, just really lovely climate. Um, but he really started out in his vision to be a farmer first, and he wanted to take care of the soil so that it would in turn take care of him. Uh, and that was sort of my great -grand great great grandfather's philosophy going forward and what he taught his children. Wow. So through the generations, we've really had a strong focus on sustainability and how we can continue to contribute to our environment and leave it in a better place than when we first started. Um, and really focused on being those farmers first and how can we better take care of that soil so it can take care of us in turn. Um, so we continued to purchase more land as we grew our business uh, and really just focused on, you know, quality is bred from the ground up. If we are able to control what goes into the bottle of wine, we're really able to control quality. And we're also able to control the outputs that are then, you know, returned back to our earth. So really focusing all of our efforts on, you know, quality driven decisions in farming uh, and how we can continue to give back in sustainable ways. That's, um, so, I mean, <laughs> that's just so much passion and so much commitment. Thank you for sharing that with us, Nikki. That was beautiful. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Um, Leanne, I, I'm tempted to ask you now, I mean, speaking of history, uh, Buena Vista is, is more historical than history itself. Um, so uh, what does it mean to be California's first premium winery? In fact, Buena Vista is also among the historical landmarks of California and of Sonoma. Uh, so what does it mean to have such a special place in the history of California? And what have been, what have been some of the learnings along the way? And what does it take to survive over 160 years of successful winemaking? Of course, dotted with a lot of learnings and so on, but do share some, some of these with us. Yes, yes, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to get to tell you a little bit about the history of California's most historic winery. So in fact, my background is this, the historic stone buildings that were built back in the 1860s. The winery itself was established in 1857, as you said, and if you take capstone, you'll learn even more about Count Augustin Harasti, who was the Hungarian gentleman that founded Buena Vista. So we were really lucky that he had this passion for wine living in Hungary. He grew up on vineyards and orchards, but he had dreams of making wine in, in California. So he self-proclaimed himself the Count. So we call him the Count. It's easier to say sometimes than Augustin Harasti. But um, he came to the United States in 1840. He immigrated. But first, you know, he had many different jobs along the way and planted grapes in many regions until he found the perfect place for him, Sonoma. So he first landed actually in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin isn't known as much for wine. It's known maybe more for cheese, but he planted grapes there. It didn't work out so well, but he did also then help to plant hops. So he start, helped to start the beer industry there in Wisconsin. So still with having those dreams of making wine in California, he followed the gold rush in 1849. So we have that famous football team here, the 49ers. During the gold rush, he went to San Diego. And so in San Diego, that is where he planted grapes again, but he was a little bit too close to the sea. It didn't quite work out, but he became the first sheriff of San Diego County and he built the first jail. So again, some oh, of these yeah. interesting jobs along the way. But soon he still had this love of wine. He wanted to make purple gold, we say. Yes. So he went, moved north to San Francisco. He planted grapes in the city of San Francisco. But those of you that have come to San Francisco may know that it actually is quite its own microclimate there. And it doesn't, the fog sometimes never lifts. So he found out that wasn't a great place to grow grapes. But he became the chief assayer of the mint there, which produced the, the money. And um, and had many jobs along the way, interesting jobs like that. But soon he was friends with General Vallejo and General Vallejo's brother, which is the Mexican general from whom we gained our independence from Mexico right in the town of Sonoma, very near Buena Vista. So we became a state and we had what was called the Bear Flag Revolt, which we all put our bear, flag, our bear on our California flag. And that's where we, we had that revolt is right near this winery, this historic place. Fantastic. So he bought, he bought the acreage from the Vallejos and started Buena Vista. And that's not where he stopped. He went back to Europe. He found, he brought back thousands of vine cuttings. So he's really considered the father of viticulture. So we're, we're really pleased sure. that our family, the Boisset family, from Burgundy originally, this was the first winery John Charles ever visited, the owner now. So we're still a family owned winery. And he had dreams of owning this winery. And, and in 2011, he made it happen. That's fantastic. Liam, this is like a movie. Has someone considered <laughs> making this into a Netflix movie yet? Because, yes, yes. Uh, you know, you were speaking and I was vividly seeing it. I mean, I thought I thought of that. And I just want to emphasize the fact that when we think of regions in the new world, we don't automatically tend to think about the history. You know, we, of course, think a bit more about innovation and we think about blends and we think about uh, single varietal wines and, you know, all of those things. But we don't naturally tend to think about history. And I hope that through today's panel discussion, 
we are making it very evident to our viewers that there's a lot of history at play here too, with so much of influence from across the globe, you know, a Hungarian coming, immigrating, the Boise family and Jean Charles Boise, a true leader, you know, also coming from Burgundian roots, now settling in California and, and living his dream. So uh, there's so much of that global influence at play in California, right? It's so it's just so fascinating to to learn about all of this, right? Yeah. Well, next up, John Doxon. I have uh, I, I I was just trying to read up a little bit more about the history of Dry Creek Vineyards, and this is about the founder David Stair, who just came to Bordeaux, or or did he come to uh, uh, Loire Valley and and Bordeaux? Found love for wines here and read something in the Wall Street Journal and just decided to completely pack his bags, pack his kids, pack his you know, family and just move lock, stock, barrel and, and, and start, you know, reinvent himself along the path of wine, right? But do tell us more. I'm, I'm obviously just sure. trying to summarize this in a single sentence. Yeah. Yes. No, you did an excellent job. Thank you, Sonal. But the, um, uh, the story of Dave Stair, our founder, as you mentioned, uh, may sound a little bit similar in some ways to the stories that Leanne and Nikki shared. And really, it was because there was a second uh, revolution of wine in the United States in the late 60s and early 1970s. What's kind of interesting is, um, you know, the, the wine industry was really booming at the time uh, that in the late 1800s, early 1900s and had a global influence. There were nearly 2000 wineries in California uh, in 1910 at the beginning of Prohibition. And then, of course, famously, our government made uh, wine selling of making and selling of wine illegal during prohibition. And so at the end of prohibition, there were only 200 wineries left. There weren't more than a thousand wineries in California established again until the 1980s uh, and, and not 2000 again until the 1990s. So there really needed to be a second revolution of, of uh, a premium wine making in California It started mostly in Napa, uh, Robert Mondavi in 1967, and Dry Creek, and our founder, Dave Stair, is part of uh, uh, the famous class of 1972, which my friend Vivian, uh, I believe, is also part of at Silver Oak. But it was us, uh, Chateau Montalena, both Stegs, Leap Wineries, Camus, Silver Oak, Jordan, um, and Dry Creek over in Sonoma, all restarted or started in this year. And uh, our founder was kind of part of that, that second wave of, of winemaking that was uh, taking over uh, Northern California. Uh, Dave Stair, our founder, was an engineer, um, MIT, Northwestern grad, smart guy, just smart enough to figure out as a young man that he hated being an engineer. Uh, his real passion was wine. And after a short stint in Germany, uh, working there, he visited the Loire Valley, fell in love when he moved back home. As you mentioned, he uh, convinced his then young family to pack everything up, sell everything, uh, leave his good job as an engineer, drive across the country, and he enrolled at UC Davis to study winemaking, used his uh, whatever he had at the time to buy a small plot of land uh, where we are today, uh, which would later become the Dry Creek Valley. Uh, our name is the same as our ADA or our Appalachian, which is a sub ADA of Sonoma County because we were actually the first winery in 1972 founded since prohibition. So that kind of goes back to tell you how long of a drought there was of, uh, of uh, winemaking in, a, in our area. No new wineries from 1910 all the way to 1972. And now we have about 85 wineries in a very small little, uh, about um, one kilometer by a six, uh, eight kilometer area, or, or excuse me, 18 kilometer area. So uh, Dry Creek Valley, where we are, is uh, um, now known today as has the largest concentration of old vine zin in the world on the benchland wow. of Dry Creek, of Dry Creek. And so we grow Zinfandel and the two whites on the valley floor that we've grown since 1972 are Loire style, Loire influenced Chenin Blanc and uh, Sauvignon Blanc for reds. Fantastic, so great uh, diversity. Yeah. And this is a real story of reinvention, right? I mean, like 
truly a, a great story. I, I, you know, I thought I was doing a good job with the reinvention story of just starting from nowhere, from a corporate career to wine. But this, this obviously aces it. Um, brilliant. Thank you for sharing that with us, John. Sure. That, was, that was really good. Um, Vivian, about Silver Oak, I, again, historically, it talks about how two gentlemen, um, you know, uh, Ray Duncan and Justin Mayer, just shook hands and started with a vision of creating the world's best Cabernet Sauvignon out there. Wines not only built for the California stage, but for the world stage and to create a style that was unprecedented and really bold and, and audacious. So tell us about this story, because this is a story also of great courage, great. And, and I also want to quickly ask, it says in the history that it started over a handshake. Was there actually ever a contract signed or did it stay on a handshake? Uh, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that's a wonderful question. <laughs> And uh, yes, eventually a contract was signed, but it was quite some time, I understand from the family, before an actual contract was signed. So Silver Oak, um, I'm very proud to represent it and I'm very, very proud to be talking here to all of you in India and around the world. Um, John kind of said it very set set it up very well, talking about the history and the second revolution, the second wave, and it really was in that second wave in the late sixties that Ray Duncan, Raymond Toomey Duncan, the founder of Silver Oak, and still the Duncan family are the owners of Silver Oak, three generations now of family there. It was in, in the late 60s that his good friend um, from Spotswood, the Novak family, told him to come from Colorado and see what was going on in California. So Ray came to visit his friends at Spotswood and he fell in love with, as so many of us have, myself included, with Northern California. And he decided to plant grapes in both Napa and Sonoma. Yes. At that point, he just wanted to be a gentleman farmer, basically. And it was over a lunch that he met this out of work winemaker called Justin Meyer. Justin had been a brother at Christian Brothers. He was a monk, essentially. He made wine there. But he was out of work because he had fallen in love with a woman. And of course, he couldn't marry a woman if he was a brother at the Christian Brothers. So he left the order. And he met through mutual friends Ray Duncan and said to Ray basically, yeah, it is great that you're a gentleman farmer, but you know what? I'm going to be your winemaker. Now you have to understand that Justin was an ebullient, bigger than life person, great personality. And indeed, on a handshake, the two men decided to found Silver Oak, which by the way, was not going to be called Silver Oak. It was going to be called Duncan Meyer. Sounds like um, a donut or a. Uh, I was thinking more office. car tires. Say what? A car tire company, maybe. Oh, car tires, exactly. And it was actually Bonnie Meyer who decided that the name Silver Oak was the name that we were going to have because we're, bet we're on the Oakville crossroads between Silverado Trail and the tiny little town, if you want to call it that, of Oakville. Silver Oak. Oak. It had nothing to do with silver and perhaps no. a little bit to do with an oak tree. So the two gentlemen shook hands and decided to found Silver Oak. And it was Justin Meyer, and we'll talk about this perhaps a little later, who made the very distinct and wise decision at that time just to make Cabernet. And we focused and we stay focused with two Cabernets, 
Silver Oak Napa Valley, and Silver Oak Cabernet, and Silver Oak Alexander Valley Cabernet. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, Vivian. You know, one thing that comes strikes me in the story is how we often think of California as a region today in all its opulence and grandiosity and its larger than life presence. But some of the beginnings have been so humble, right? There's so much humility in the beginnings. I was also reading that uh, the, 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 the two partners, they started in a dairy barn. Am I right? With the wine yeah. making. And that's yeah. not ordinarily what somebody would imagine. One would think, oh, they, you know, we, we think of California as a, a very wealthy, well-to-do sort of a region. Uh, but when you deep dive into the history, there's so much. And, you know, the reason I ask about the contract is this, there was also so much conviction, right, out there, so much belief, so much conviction for what could be the possibilities Um and these are just incredible stories. So thank you all, firstly, for sharing uh, the history and the legacy at each of the individual wineries. They were, those, those were really wonderful stories. Um, Nikki, coming back to you, I would like to ask you, going more into the grape varieties, the, the Chardonnay, uh, Vente is credited with uh, pre first introducing the most widely planted and probably the most successful clone or cutting of Chardonnay there is in California today. But this was first introduced by the Vente family. And I have, of course, on numerous occasions tasted the uh, Vente Chardonnay. I'm going to about to taste one now as well. But tell us more about how this started and how has Chardonnay today worked for you all in portfolio? Because now today you have so many other wines. But tell us a bit more about the Chardonnay in particular, because that's such a unique story again. Yeah, absolutely. So back in 1908, my great, great grandfather really was interested in broadening what we had planted. And at that time, we hadn't planted very many things apart from Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon. Um, we had some Grenache and, you know, some heavier varieties as well. And, and he really wanted to just look outside of the box and continue to strive for quality. So he sent his son, Ernest, to go look around at neighbor vineyards and find some, some Chardonnay. And we luckily had a, a neighboring vineyard, the Theodore Gear Vineyard in Pleasanton, California, um, that had a, a significant planting of Chardonnay, probably about three acres. Um, and we were able to get some cuttings from him and plant that in our vineyard. And those cuttings came from the 1980, or excuse me, 1880 um, importation of cuttings that Charles Wetmore did from France. So from those cuttings, after the first year in 1912, my great-great-grandfather loved the first vintage. It was just beautiful. The flavors were exceptional. So um, he sent his son off to go find some more cuttings. Uh, and this time they looked in France. So we actually went to the university at Montpellier and were able to get some cuttings of Chardonnay there and bring them back to California. And what we did was we actually just planted them within the same block. So now we have two different source woods in one block of Chardonnay that was just growing. And Ernest took it upon himself to go through the vineyard every year and look at the vines that had beautiful growth. And then during the ripening period, he was tasting berries and the vines that had really great growth with really wonderful flavors, um, as well as great cluster morphology and you know didn't look to have any diseases, he would mark those vines with a ribbon at the base uh, and then during dormancy, he would come back and take cuttings from those specific vines and continue to grow our, our supply of Chardonnay. And as you heard from John uh, earlier about Prohibition, uh, 1912 is pretty close to when we hit Prohibition. Um, but we were really fortunate to be able to partner with Bullyu Winery during Prohibition to be providing white wine for sacramental and medicinal purposes. Um, and that was how we were able to continue producing wine. And we actually continued to grow our supply of Chardonnay during Prohibition, which was really odd. People just didn't keep planting, especially not Chardonnay, because it's not a very hardy grape that you can ship for home winemaking or any of the things that you were allowed to do with grapes. Um, it, it wasn't the best variety for that. So growing our stock of Chardonnay was actually pretty, pretty incredible that my, my great great grandfather was able to do that. Um, and then once Prohibition ended in 1936, we released a wine that said 
Pinot Chardonnay, which is what we were calling Chardonnay back then. Um, But it said that on the label, which was very rare as well. People didn't really do that at that time um, because it it wasn't something that we learned from France and Italy. Uh, They weren't doing that. They weren't putting the variety on the label. So when people started trying our wine and knew what was in the bottle, that really attracted other growers to come to the Wente property and ask to take cuttings. And that's sort of how it spread like wildfire, where people were having the Wente clone on their property as well. And it really all came from Ernest's passion and how he was really dedicated to finding the beautiful flavor profile that is now the Wente clone. And it has almost like a muscat characteristic to it that really is a beautiful round flavor and is something that a lot of people consider to be what that traditional Chardonnay of California is. Oh, lovely. And do other producers who have the Venti clone, do they openly say we have the Venti clone? Do they give credit? or is A lot of the- producers really do. Yeah. Uh, you see it on the back of people's label a lot. Um, people claim it on their website. Oh, so it, it, it was a really fun project for my, uh, my older sister. She was uh, in high school working for our family over the summer, and they had her calling all wineries around California trying to see how many acres of 1G clone they had planted um, to track down, you know, how, how wide it actually is spread. And she ended up finding that it, it seemed about 70 to 75% of Chardonnay planted in California was of that descendant. So whether it was heat treated versions or an actual old heritage selection of the Wente clone, but pretty. I love, pretty that, story. I love that story of generosity and magnanimity. I think that's so important. It's, a, it's so important to, to act as a community as a whole. And it's so important to have that camaraderie among everybody to give each other due credit when it's due, you know, it's like, it's, Unlike, unlike other industries, which sometimes if, if it's too small, there can be a bit of a crab mentality. You try to pull down or there's too much competitiveness because there's not enough room for growth. But I, can, I guess in case of the Californian wine industry, there's so much room for you know, continuous improvement and growth then, and, and so much prosperity uh, the, the region has witnessed that everybody has been larger than life and everyone's been so generous with, with, with acknowledging each other's uh, success stories. So that's that's really wonderful to hear. Thanks for sharing that, Nikki. Um, Leanne, ever since the Boise family took over the, the restoration and the entire upgradation of Buena Vista, we all know and we've all witnessed how there's been absolutely no stone unturned, literally no stone unturned. Um, so, you know, uh, not only are there hand, hand, hand dug caves, but larger than life hospitality, tourism centers, and so many fantastic wine labels that look, um, you know, could, could even give jewelry, real jewelry, a, a run, right, for their, for their money. So, so much of, um, so much of, of course, George Charles' personality coming through on the wines, but uh, just this whole broader, bigger than, larger than life vision on, um, on, on putting Buena Vista out there on the global map. So tell us a bit more about that, but also in terms of wines, what sort of successes have you all seen in terms of whether it's packaging or it's certain styles of wine, certain varieties, what has thrived internationally for Buena Vista and within California? Great. Yes. Well, so as you mentioned, I think it all begins with the, with our owner, the, the family of Boisse. So Jean-Charles Boisse is only the second generation, him and his sister coming from the small village of Bujo in, in Burgundy. So he was born in great vineyards, but he had dreams of coming to California after he visited this winery when he was 11 years old. So I think he has some similarities in the count with his entrepreneurial risk-taking you know, character. And he does like to try things. So with Buena Vista, right away when he bought the winery in 2011, he retrofitted these buildings because, of course, we have earthquakes and fires in California that um, luckily Buena Vista narrowly missed in 2017. So uh, and also the 2014 earthquake. Our buildings had all been retrofitted in 2012. So they had been condemned before that from the larger earthquakes before we had had. So we renovated those buildings and now we're making wine in these first, the first caves ever dug in California. So first and foremost, we wanted to make this a place where everyone is welcome to visit from all over the world. 
and all cultures to learn about the history of California winemaking. So we actually have a wine museum also at Buena Vista on the third floor of our second building over here. And it has wine tools through the ages, you know, showing what we, what we might have used, what, what we might have used to get rid of phylloxera back in the day, or we tried, <laughs> um, and other types of tools like this. And so uh, John Charles wanted to show that first and foremost, but then with the wine styles, we have a California winemaker, Brian Maloney, who is many generations from Sonoma. And so I think it's great because we have that European influence, Pinot Noir being one of the varietals and Chardonnay, since the birthplace of those varietals are from Burgundy, is a focus for us. However, we also play around with a lot of other varietals, heritage varietals of California. Uh, one of the varietals that I'm really loving right now, and it's doing well for us in the international stage, is Petit Syrah. So we use that in blending and you hear about Zinfandel a lot, which we love our Zinfandel, John, mm -hmm. but Petit Syrah also is a nice marriage between the two or for blending and some of our nice, big, bold red blends like the Sheriff that we do. Lovely. And then we put jewelry on the bottle because John Charles loves jewelry and he designs jewelry. And so we have a Sheriff's badge on the Sheriff, but we also have a crocodile to tell the story of the Count's sad demise, which we didn't tell you yet. But sadly, after the winery went bankrupt and phylloxera was coming in, the little root louse that took over the vines, the Count left Buena Vista bankrupt. And he went to Nicaragua to try his hand at rum. He gave up on winemaking after they pushed him out. And the legend has it that as he was scouting out sheer cane plantations, he was crossing a river. He held onto a branch. He fell into the river and all that was found was his clothes. So he was eaten by a crocodile is what we, we believe. So we put a crocodile on one of our bottles to kind of honor that history and and try to bring yes. it back to life. But what a crocodile it is. It's a seriously stunning crocodile with these ruby eyes. And I often wonder, I have a bottle at home and I wonder if that's real ruby. Um, but uh, I, must, I must recount the time when George Charles was in India. Uh, and he, I think, came with a whole lot of his jewelry designs. And as we progressed through the evening uh, with the wine tastings, he so generously, like true royalty, I was handing over his jewelry to everyone in the room. And, and so now every time I'm at social parties in Mumbai, they all turn up wearing his jewelry. So it's like Aww. everyone's become like a George Charles ambassador in Mumbai a little bit because of the jewelry and of course the wine. So thank you. That's 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 wonderful. Um, John, uh, about Dry Creek, it's just so fascinating to know that some of the oldest vines, especially Zinfandels, are what, uh, what Dry Creek prides itself on. And you also mentioned so many other styles like the Chenin Blanc, the Sauvignon Blanc uh, that are made. I was also, uh, you know, from what I understand about the Dry Creek philosophy, it's really a no compromise philosophy. And in an age where we talk about speed and, and size does matter, it's really the slower the smaller, uh, the less is more sort of an approach that Dry Creek takes on its winemaking philosophies. So how, how does that work for you all in the, in, in, within California and in the global markets? And also, I'd love to hear from you what styles you believe are really thriving uh, and are being more proactively received from international markets uh, from Dry Creek. Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sonal. I think, um, you know, you mentioned kind of, I, our founder, Dave, and his daughter, Kim, who runs the winery now, um, likes to, to say that, you know, we were either too uh, stubborn or stupid to change much uh, for a lot of our 50 years in existence. And that's actually uh, proved to be quite fortuitous for us. So the Chenin Blanc and the Sauvignon Blanc style based on the Loire Valley, no oak, no malolactic, uh, picking at uh, lower sugars with higher acids um, was popular when, when uh, Dave got started, but not so much uh, here in the United States, especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, but we stuck with it. Um, I think we're the, we're the only winery uh, that's made a Chenin Blanc continuously uh, since 1972 and always in that style. So stylistically, 
I think, thankfully, that's kind of come back around. And uh, for us here in the United States, maybe it was actually even catching up uh, in some way to the European style of, you know, where wine was more of a complement to food. I think that's more of a recent uh, phenomenon here in the United States. And it's so it served us well in the international markets to always kind of stick to that style, uh, especially for our whites and our reds. You mentioned the Zinfandel, uh, one of the wines that we sell there in India, um, has always also kind of been made in more of an old school style. Uh, we, we blend in a good um, uh, chunk of Petit Syrah uh, that gives the wine some um, tannic integrity. Uh, we are grown in this famous area for Zinfandel, Dry Creek Valley, um, that is rather unique for Zin in that it's a cooler area to grow Zin. Uh, we're blanketed by fog for about two or three more hours uh, than our neighbors in the northern parts of uh, just north of us. Even within our own AVA, there's two distinct microclimates, climate zone one and climate zone two. And in the southern part of our valley, it's, it's a cooler uh, area to grow Zinfandel. And so that style has always been to make a Zin that's not over the top kind of bombastic no. uh, sweet at all Zinfandel. Our, our style, uh, as long as we've made it, has always been for Zin, especially in that vein of uh, wine that could complement food as well. Um, and some cool, you know, being around for 50 years in the United States is a part of that second wave, some cool things have happened along the way. We were actually the first winery to use the term old vine uh, on a label here in California. And of course it had been done for, you know, around for, for many years prior, but nobody had actually used the term on a label. We weren't quite smart enough to patent the term old vine, uh, but we were the first in 85 to use the term. And so it's been, um, you know, the whites are, are the wines that we were famous for early on, but Zinn and Cabernet was really kind of the second generation's uh, passion to uh, bring those wines up to the same level as our whites. Excellent. Well, I actually have the glass of the Heritage Wines in Fundel, and I thought I actually, that was supposed to be my third round of questions, but I'm thinking now ah. in the interest of time, maybe I parallelly also, uh, I don't know if you, if you all are tasting uh, at your end, uh, but... I have a few glasses of wine here. Uh, yeah, all your wine. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Uh, but I just wanted to share with you, John, that just two nights ago, we actually rounded up some of the leading sommeliers of, uh, of Mumbai, which is the city where I, where I live. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were about 10 of us and we all got together around the table and we tasted some of your wines, actually. Uh, um, and we must say the Zinfandel was surprisingly uh, such a delight because I think the Psalms expected to find something which was more stewed or uh, something more raisiny or something more, you know, and what we found on in the glass was something just very much more fresher, more vibrant, a lot more unassuming. Uh, so it was really wonderful, but this is a 2016, so it shows quite a bit of development on its color. And um, I just wanted to share with our viewers that all the wines and all the wineries that we that we are um, talking about and discussing on this panel are available in India. So that's great news. That's I mean they're all available here and and uh, therefore your enjoyment and for doing business with. So just thought that would Thank be important. So but yeah, this the little square, this little area where we are. Sonal is not just us. It's a it's a style of Zin. I think that you spoke to so well. Uh, that's not just from us, but it's our valley. So within one little area, um, just a uh, uh, two kilometers, it's us, Ridge, Raffinelli, Segesio's Cortina Vineyard, and the two top growers in our in our area, the Moritzens, and, and um, uh, especially grow for us and and all of those that I mentioned. And it's this area where cooler climate. Uh, combined with uh, a, a, a fantastic um, source of older vine zins that um, I think I have one behind me here. Kind of look like this. If I oh, can that's get out beautiful. Of my, ah, these gnarly yeah. old head prune vines kind of look more like uh, overgrown bonsai trees than they do grape vines, but they produce less but better fruit. And the zin that, that uh, you have there in your glass is clonally sourced from these old vines, but tea budded over the last 25 years onto younger vines. So it's a good uh, kind of way to 
to combine old vine DNA um, uh, with uh, younger vine um, uh, price points, to be honest with you. And in this cooler region, it, it still produces uh, Zinfandel that you mentioned is not stewed or over the top syrup. Yeah, no, it's not. I mean, although it's a 2016, it's kind of showing evolution and the tannins are really integrated, silky smooth. It's got a really lovely smooth finish, uh, beautiful mouthfeel, but not still not jammy or stewed in any way at all. So it's, it's, it's really lovely. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And thank you. Speaking about the wine. Um, Vivian, um, I really just want to know about what were the landmark events or milestone events that happened in the history and not just history, but in the entire journey of Silver Oak wines, particularly maybe the Cabernet Sauvignon, which received so much critical acclaim around the world. And while you were sharing the story, I'm gonna share pictures of this beautiful label, simply stunning and shiny and beautiful and so clean and just so enigmatic. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm gonna taste this wine and thank you. It's a real treat to be having this wine in our glasses this evening. Well, it's, thank you so much, Sonal. Um, so as I mentioned, Silver Oak was founded in 1972 and it was really Justin Meyer who made that very decisive and correct decision for us to just make Cabernet. And to this day, 50 years later, Silver Oak only makes two Cabernets, one from Alexander Valley, which is the That's wine you're tasting, right. and one from Napa Valley. But not only did he make that decision, he also made the decision about the use of oak. And this has been one of the reasons why Silver Oak remains today as one of the preeminent Cabernets from, um, the, from Napa and Sonoma. And that was, we did not use French oak. He did a lot of experimentation and we decided to use, or he decided to use American oak. And the reason he decided to use American oak was that it gave the wine a sort of spicy character. Yes. It, it has a tighter grain. Yes. And so it's less tannic and it actually gives it a sort of creamy texture. And it was that taste profile that honestly sprung us into the position that we still to this day have. We are the only winery in the United States that own our own American oak cooperage. It's in Missouri, it's not in California, and we source the, the, the wood from the trees of Missouri and Iowa. Um, we, the Duncan family, used to own it about 50% ownership of the cooperage. And then in 2015, we purchased it entirely. And now we are the largest employer in this wonderful little town of Higby, Missouri. And it allows us to really control the quality of the oak. And so with the Alexander Valley, the wine spends two years actually in American oak barrels. Half of it is new and half of it is once used. So uh, oh, no. once used, so it's once used. With the Napa Valley, which we're not tasting today, the wine is aged also for two years, but in brand new oak barrels every vintage. And therefore, it's, in t it's really important that we get the very best quality. The two oaks don't meet, meaning that Napa oak stays in Napa and yeah. Alexander Valley stays in Alexander yeah. Valley. So that's part of, of our, our history with regards to Cabernet. Of course, wineries like to expand. We've never expanded under the Silver Oak name, but we have expanded the winery under the Toomey name, which is owned by the family of Silver Oak, where we make Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc. But Silver Oak will always remain Cabernet. And on the label, which you just showed, um, you see our iconic water tower, this white 
um, building is a water tower and you'll find that at all at, at our wineries and also at some of our vineyards. Um, and then behind it is the oak. Um, the water tower now of course is not where we pump water, we're in modern day life, although with the drought who knows, um, but uh, it's now used as a storage unit actually. But it's, it has become our logo and symbolic to Silver Oak. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because you actually, I mean, I, I, obviously you, you said it so accurately, which you would. But even as I was tasting and you were speaking of the tasting notes, I was almost going through, yes, yes, because I was literally getting all of that. It, there's so much restraint. And, and elegance on this wine, because I was thinking, okay, I'm tasting something from California. And yes, Alexander Hills is meant to be a clue, but one would naturally expect something more um, open and audacious maybe, or, uh, you know, there's so much restraint. There's so much elegance on this wine. And I know I'm repeating myself, but the point is that the, the grain is tighter and it, it's, it's um, the spice. The herbiness on this wine is just so evident. I, if I may say, there's also some level of minerality. It's almost got that old world charm. And not to give old world any more credit than the new world in that sense. I mean, in probably in the most complimenting way. But but it's really just got that um, linearity to it, uh, which was so wonderful. And and you know what's amazing is it's not typical generally on Cabernet Sauvignons especially to find any kind of red fruit character, but there's so much freshness even on this wine that I actually get some amount of raspberry or a cherry-like sort of a note on the wine, which is lovely. But the, the potpourri of herbs and spices, which are again, delicate. Uh, as an American oak, we would expect, I would have expected a more open grain or something where the spices were more warmer spices, but these are just sweet and um, elegant spices. So I'm really enjoying this wine. Thank you, Vivian. Really, Thank really. Thank you, Sonal. The other thing I just want to add is that we tend to pick a little earlier ah. than some of our colleagues as well. Right. So um, that I think also adds to the elegance of the wine that you're picking up. Thank you, perfect. And and one would expect the Napa also because it's um, it's more in 100% oak, uh, new oak, sorry. It would be a bit more structured, a bit more toastier perhaps? It's, um, so the difference between the two, that's a good, good observation. The difference between the two is that Alexander Valley tends to be almost 100% Cabernet. I think this vintage is about 95%. Yeah. Whereas Napa Valley is more layered because it's more of a Bordeaux blend. It's more like 78 to 82% Cabernet subject to the vintage. Awesome. So well, it has a more layered structure. That, that puts my old world comment into context, I suppose. Yes, it does actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 actually, I don't know why, but I didn't know about the, the blend. I, I was thinking I'm tasting a Cabernet Sauvignon, but it was very old world. I didn't want to explicitly say Bordeaux, but uh, yeah, it, it explains everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed that wine. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, it's really a pity that our viewers can't taste along with us. There's always a challenge to, to with logistics, with wine samples within India. Uh, it's not as easy as it would be in, in California to just send small samples of wines and so on. There's lots of regulations here. So very sadly, our viewers are just listening in and hopefully benefiting from this conversation. But we're unable to send literally tasting samples to everybody, which we would have loved to do if we could. Um, but Leanne, I'm going to taste your Pinot Noir now. I'm going to taste the Buena Vista North Coast Pinot Noir. We talked about North Coast as part of the presentation earlier today for everyone to have a context of where it is and the coastal influence and the, the freshness. But tell me your personal thoughts about this wine and how this is doing in, you know, overall, in the overall portfolio. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, as you mentioned, and you, you were teaching everybody about the maps, North Coast is a large Appalachian, American viticulture area. But for us, what we blend in is we blend from Sonoma and Lake County, 
which is just a little north of Napa, actually. And then we also blend in some Russian River Valley, which is in Sonoma County and known for Pinot Noir and the Sonoma coastline. So, and Sonoma coast is kind of the cooler area, you know, closest to the sea, the cold Pacific Ocean. So Pinot Noir does very well in, in this area. And then also a little bit from Carneros, which is where our winery is located. Carneros is the only appellation that part of it is in Napa and part of it is in Sonoma. And so a lot of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay is grown there and a lot of sparkling wine is actually produced there because of the acidity that we have from that region. Yes. So that's where the grapes are coming from. On um, this one, we do a blend of oak because our heritage is Hungarian. We like to play around with some Hungarian oak actually, which is very similar to French oak in a lot of ways. So as far as what you, you get out of the texture and the spice. Yes. But in this one, we actually also used a touch of American oak. So we kind of blended all the cultures together, you know, using our California terroir, we say our California grapes, but then all of the cultures of the oak for about seven months. So, you know, we, not, we want a, a touch of the richness from California, but then also the nice acidity from the coastline. And what I like about this wine is, you know, on the tasting notes, you know, you should get a bit of spice. So, yeah. you know, a lot of that comes from like the Russian River area where you might get some cola spice or you might yes. get some cardamom and clove. You know, yes. my days reminiscing about being in India, I have my chai latte with me to 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 feel this uh, spice of India because I'm missing visiting all of you. But uh, this kind of reminds me cardamom, clove, these sort of spices you should get a touch of. Very, very evident. The spice. Um profile of this wine again loads of freshness um and uh, you know just lovely complexity coming through which Pinot Noir is you know quite famous for but this one uh, really has that um what I wanted to share with you Leanne was that Pinot Noir as a grape variety and as a style is doing exceptionally well in India and thank god for some silver lining to the pandemic our people discovered and started leaning towards lighter, more elegant styles of wines because they were encouraging more home drinking. And so they were looking to drink what was easier on the palate. So definitely white wines, rosé wines and lighter reds were the direct beneficiaries of this trend. So Pinot Noirs are like that, going like that in India in terms of sales trend. And so um, there is absolutely no doubt that the Buena Vista Pinot Noir only stands to gain uh, from that trend in India. Oh. I do want to ask you all one question each about India, but I just thought before we do that, I'm going to also taste the Morning Fog Venti Chardonnay, uh, the only white that we're tasting today. So I thought I'd leave that for the last um, in the reverse order. If, if but, uh, but tell us about, so I tasted this wine and it actually featured on our 20 wines to drink in 2020. We did a series of 20 videos where we featured 20 wines to drink in 2020 in the last quarter of 2020, just before ending the year. And we featured this wine as one among uh, my personal recommendations for our viewers at the time. And I, I, I remember a lot of our, our followers and friends reaching out to us to say, we love that video. We went and looked for this wine. We bought it. We drank it. We love it. Uh, so... Um, so no, but we want to hear from you, Nikki. Tell us, uh, is is where does this feature among your personal favorites? Yeah, this uh, this wine is one of my personal favorites. It's like my husband and I drink this most nights. I'm seven months pregnant, so I have to wait a couple more months before I can share a bottle with him again. But oh, um, this wine, we named it Morning Fog after the morning fog that rolls in um, from the coast. Uh, in the Livermore Valley, we really don't have much fog past 9 a.m. So it's that 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. fog is what really keyed this name. And we actually ended up expanding this wine to be a Central Coast wine, not just Livermore Valley, so we could expand to our Arroyo Seco vineyards as well and integrate the best flavors from there. And they have what I like to call the all-day fog, but it still really rings true to the morning fog uh, Promise. And what that is, is that we're really trying to provide a very fresh fruit flavor that's well balanced by oak, 
but not overpowered by oak. So no. we have a little bit of oak in there. Most of it is actually going to be a uh, second or third use. And then we have just a little bit of new oak in there because we want it to be balanced. We want it to be vibrant. Uh, and I think that the flavor is really that, that golden apple, that creaminess yes. jump out of the glass. Um, and that is just that, that beautiful expression of California Chardonnay from the, the cool mornings, that big diurnal shift that we see on the coastal regions from warmer days and really cold nights that allows that acidity to just be really fresh. Yes. Um, and it is American and French oak. And I think those two play really nicely together in this wine. I love this and I, I couldn't agree more on the description. There's all that creaminess. Uh, it's a really ripe and a juicy expression of a Chardonnay, but it been in no measure lacking freshness again. You know, there's so much of that mouth-watering quality. It's kind of, it's round, but yet it's, it's uplifting and energizing. What I find about this wine, two things. One is it transforms in the glass. I've now had it a few times. Uh, we had it again the other day when we did the sommelier tasting and we find that if you let the wine sit in your glass for a bit, it actually opens up more and it transforms. Perhaps that little kiss of oak that's in the wine allows it to open up a bit more if you let it rest. And the other thing is, I've, I've had these glasses here with me since the start of our, our you know, meeting, this discussion today. So they've warmed up a bit and the reds are fine, but actually I find that this is one white that pairs up with the reds at the same temperature. So if you drink it even at a red wine temperature, it really shows its vibrancy and its fleshiness and its roundness and its generosity uh, of fruit and flavor. Uh, so I, you know, this is the second time I'm enjoying this wine at a red wine temperature, and I find that it's far more enjoyable at that rather than something that is a bit more frosty and cold. Um, so thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable wine. And uh, yeah, I, I just want to really thank you all for this incredible opportunity, but I do, I know we've run out of time, we're one minute over 9.30, but I can't let you all go today without giving me one or two sentences just about your thoughts on the Indian wine market. What does it mean for you and your wines to be in India? And what, what is your impression overall? And what are you looking forward to uh, for your wines in the Indian wine market? And we can start with you, Nikki. Go, go how we started. Yeah, so um, I, as you know, I'm not a sales representative, uh, but what I do know of the Indian market is that um, you guys really do pride quality of product and that the, the wine drinkers in India are definitely looking for something that is going to express a lot of quality and, you know, really showcase some of the finest wines in California. So we are very excited to be a part of the Indian market and would love to continue to grow in your market because I think it's a, definitely a place that would be great for our wine portfolio um, as we continue to, you know, showcase more of our, our different offerings. Amazing. Thank you so very much for, for that. Uh, how about you, Liam? I, I realized I did not show the Vente and the Buena Vista label, so I'm going to do that now. Is there sure. a clear morning for Chardonnay? Awesome. And the Buena Vista Pinot Noir, North Coast. Yeah, thank you. The historic type. Yes. Well, India, yes. India for me, you know, I had the honor and privilege to get to come to India for us to help launch some of our wines there. And I just have to say the feeling once you go and experience it, we feel, I feel that we align, you know, as cultures, when I think of India, I think of color, spice, exuberance, passion for life and for people. And so we feel that it's where we want to be. Wine is also about passion. It's not always about every last dollar in the business. It's about where do we want to go in the future, grow together as cultures and intertwine our cultures. I got the, I was also able to come to India during Holy Festival. And I know you have this this Friday. I wish yes. you all the best for Holy Festival. And I hope you get to enjoy some colorful uh California wines as well with your Holy Fest. Oh, that's wonderful. That, that reach right here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. John, how about you? Your thoughts on the Indian wine market? Yeah. You know, uh, for us, we're a, a smaller uh, family-owned winery. So we, it's not, export is not a huge percent of our total business. 
But I think it's very important for us to be in key markets around. You have to be a global brand today, I think, to be uh, relevant, you know, even, even a smaller winery like us. So for us, from that standpoint, uh, Mumbai is just as important as Manhattan, you know, for us to be relevant and in the market. And what we look for, we're only in about uh, 15 or 20 markets outside of the United States. But what we, we look for is markets that appreciate, um, uh, that build uh, with education and storytelling. And what we found with our partner there, Monica, is uh, Monica Enterprises is a great partner that values educating um, and storytelling. And so for those of us that that value that, like the four wineries here today that value, that have a story to tell, uh, I think it's important, it's an important it's important that you're in India, um, you know, that values those those aspects of um, representing and building wines. That's that's beautifully put, John. I was speaking to another potential exporter of, of wine to India and his observations also was that we want to be in India because it may be a small market, but it's a, it's a market that is very enthusiastic about wine in a very civil way. Uh, it was his way of describing it, but I thought it sounded all right, uh, you know, in, in a nice way, you know, in a true appreciation way. Uh, I, we, we all believe the India wine market, India market is actually ready uh, for better and better and, and exciting wines. Um, so wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for um, your vote of endorsement. Amazing. Sure. Thank you. Vivian, for how about you? Your, your thoughts on, on how it's been and how you feel about being in the Indian wine market? The silver oil. Oh, we're, we're thrilled to be in the Indian wine market. We've actually been exporting small amounts because obviously we're at a very high price point um, for about 10 years through Sanjay Manon and Sansula. And India, I can see, has so much potential for us all as, as the education which you're doing, Sonal, around California and, and the education that the, the consumer is getting. It's, it's an exciting market. It has some, it has some uh, challenges, I would say, uh, particularly around labeling and taxes, etc. But I can see us moving forward and we're all very thrilled to be there and I can't wait to see what's going to happen with California wines in the Indian market within the next 10 years. And I think it's going to take a while, but it's growing and it will continue to grow. And I can't wait to come. Amazing. Well, you should, Vivian, and we'd be so happy to welcome you and as will Sanjay be. And we'll all, we'll all take turns in showing you around and, and showing you the best slice of India there is to show you. Uh, I'm going to raise not one, but two two glasses. I wish I could raise four, but not that ambidextrous. Use a bottle. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to raise two glasses to, uh, you know, what, what today signifies perhaps as the endemic, uh, hopefully, and, uh, and uh, raising a toast to the golden state of California and to golden times ahead. Uh, thank you so much for being on this on this discussion today. Uh, on behalf of all our viewers and everybody who's who's joined in, a huge, huge thank you for sharing your valuable insights, for sharing your passion, for for showing your love. So um, until next time, cheers. I, I you know, have a thank good you. day. You thank know. you, Sana. Thank you, Sana. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you for watching. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, guys, that was uh, that was us. That was the California Wine Knowledge Summit brought to you by Sonal Holland Wine Academy, but fully powered by the California Wine Institute. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to the California Wine Institute and Capstone California for supporting this evening and for enabling this evening, uh, this enabling this powerful discussion we've just had with some of the star iconic wine producers of California. And we're hugely grateful and I hope all of you viewers have benefited from today's insights and are looking forward to tasting and enjoying Californian wines in days to come. Thank you. Much love. Good night. See you all and happy holy. Uh, um, do the ender again. You're not like. Do the end. Just do the ender again. Just do end the part. One slash. One last. Jaldi kar. Huh? Edwin. Edwin.
Three, two, one, go. All right, guys, that was us. And that is it for tonight. That was a, an amazing, hopefully you discovered a lot about Californian wines. And I want to extend a huge thank you to the California Wine Institute and Capstone California for empowering us this evening and bringing this wealth of information and knowledge to all our viewers in India. I hope you've gained some valuable insights from today's learning and today's discovery. And we're really hoping that you can go out there, uh, give you a huge vote of confidence and a huge thumbs up to Californian wines and support them uh, in every possible way you can. If you're a consumer, drink more Californian wines. If you're in the trade, then uh, you know support Californian wines through listings, through through buying, through selling, uh, in every way and any way that you can. I thank you all again for tonight. And don't forget our little, little giveaway to you uh, with love, which is the Capstone California Introductory Level 1, which you can access on our website, www.sonalhollandwineacademy.com. No fine print coming to you completely free of cost. Avail of this amazing offer. Go on the website and download the course for free and get your certification. It's a certifying course. So it's it's just amazing. I've done it myself. It's truly worth the time and effort. Awesome guys, on that note, good night and have a good weekend. Although weekend's a little away, but happy holy, well in advance. See you all, lots of love, cheers. <laughs>